In October 2014, Rurik Judding, a 29-year-old British investor, was living in a luxurious one-bedroom apartment, popular among foreign investment bankers in Wan Chai. Among the activities at the apartment complex where Rurik lived were a cigar lounge, a billiard room, and a sky garden. Rurik Judding came from a privileged background. He was born in the southeast England town of Cobham in the county of Surrey. Graham and Helen, his parents, raised Rurik in a mansion worth over a million dollars. It was a beautiful Victorian-style house with a lovely garden. Helen worked as a nursery school teacher, while Graham worked as an engineer. In addition to being wealthy, Rurik was highly intelligent and attended only the finest schools in the United Kingdom. After boarding school at Winchester College, Rurik enrolled in Cambridge University. Rurik studied history and law at Cambridge University, two subjects that helped him gain a position in the corporate banking field after graduating. Between 2008 and 2010, Rurik worked as a personal banking manager for Barclays, a United Kingdom-based firm. When Rurik was employed by Barclays, he earned almost £300 a year as a salary. Years after Rurik left the company, the division in which he worked was shut down for helping its clients evade taxes. Rurik was hired by Bank of America Merrill Lynch soon after he left Barclays and made almost twice as much money there as he did at Barclays. In 2010, Rurik relocated to Hong Kong with his firm. Raised in a wealthy family, Rurik had a tendency to buy things merely for the sake of owning them. He liked to risk his money when he played competitive poker. Even though a lot of people considered Rurik very intelligent, most of them agreed that he was also very socially awkward. Several of Rurik's classmates remember him walking around with an air of smugness and can tell that he considered himself quite attractive. Moreover, he had an innocent appearance and looked like a schoolboy. When Rurik lived in Wan Chai, he met Joanna Mendoza, a bar girl working at Club Rio in Angeles City, a notorious sex resort in the Philippines. Joanna and Rurik connected despite being from different countries, and she claimed it wasn't just about his money. According to Joanna Mendoza, in an interview with the Daily Mail, Rurik dumped another bar girl in order to date her. He set her up in Manila and gave her an allowance of 900 euros a month. He stipulated that Joanna could not see any other men during their relationship. However, Rurik allegedly ended his relationship with Joanna in an email after he got into a fight with one of her friends. In 2014, Rurik was suffering from a severe addiction to cocaine. He consumed three grams of uncut cocaine each day. Joanna Mendoza said Rurik enjoyed drinking alcohol, although he never drank beer. It was common for Rurik to drink four bottles of wine, champagne, vodka, and energy drinks daily. At times, Joanna said Rurik couldn't sleep, and she would wake up at 2 a.m. and find him reading and drinking. Even though Rurik drank so much, he never seemed affected by it. Based on the number of drugs and alcohol Rurik consumed, an expert toxicologist said he should have been in a coma. Nevertheless, he was in complete control of his actions. Rurik spent 1,500 Hong Kong dollars on drugs every day. As Rurik had an endless supply of money, financing his drug addiction was never a problem. Rurik left an out-of-office email reply with an explanation that he would be out of work indefinitely a few weeks before the horrific events of November 1, 2014. He recommended anyone calling him to contact someone who was not an insane psychopath. The automated reply read, For escalation, please contact God, but I suspect the devil will have custody. Last line only really worked if I had followed through. In November 2014, Rurik's mental stability deteriorated to the point where his behavior was out of control. The Hong Kong police received a 999 call from Rurik at 3.42 a.m. informing them that he needed help. My name is Rurik Judding. About five minutes ago, I just killed, shit, murdered this woman. 
he chillingly whispered to the dispatcher. Upon entering Rurik's luxury apartment, the authorities were shocked to find the horrific scene waiting for them. A naked and nearly dead woman lay beside Rurik in the living room. The 12-inch knife found at the crime scene had inflicted severe injuries on the woman. She was covered in stab wounds all over her body. In Rurik's apartment, authorities also found an abundance of sex toys and drugs. The woman passed away as the police were examining the scene. She was later identified as Sisang Mujiasi, a 26-year-old woman. Rurik was apprehended on site. While examining Rurik's apartment, investigators found a piece of luggage on Rurik's balcony. After opening it up, they discovered a nearly decapitated woman's bloated, decomposed body. Her name was Sumardi Ningsi. Investigators were convinced that the 23-year-old woman's body had been decomposing outside for weeks. Both of Rurik's victims were Indonesian women on tourist visas to Hong Kong. According to ABC News correspondent Juliana Liu, Rurik was dressed casually on his first day in court. The judge asked him if he understood the charges against him, and he seemed calm throughout the hearing. As a result of the murders, the tabloids were filled with rumors about Rurik's life. They were fascinated by the wealthy British millionaire investment banker who murdered two sex workers. There were allegations that Rurik was engaged and that his fiancée had cheated on him during their engagement, devastating him. The media outlets spent hours digging through Rurik's social media accounts in order to find out as much as they could about his past. In Wan Chai, the murders shocked the residents as Hong Kong is considered safe and has one of the lowest murder rates in the world. Sadly, Samarti and Sisang didn't have the luxury of security. Samarti Ningxi got married when she was 18 years old and shortly after, she had a child with her husband. While Samarti was pregnant, the father of her child left her. However, she continued to live with her parents who helped her raise her child. At the time of the murder, Samardi's child was five. The Chinese government granted Samardi a visa so she could work as a domestic worker in Hong Kong in 2011. Typically, a domestic worker in Hong Kong was employed by affluent families in the city to take care of their homes. About 5% of Hong Kong's population comprises domestic helpers, most of whom are women. As of 2019, 400,000 domestic workers were working in Hong Kong. According to Hong Kong law, domestic helpers must live in their employers' homes, where they cook, clean, and take care of children. As the breadwinner of her family, Samardi sent most of her income back to her mother and father in Indonesia. She took part in a DJ course after returning to Indonesia in 2013 so that she can learn how to DJ. Samardi told her parents she was returning to Hong Kong in 2014 to look for a job as a DJ. However, finding a job in that industry proved more difficult than she thought. It wasn't long after that she was back working in the sex trade once again. When Samardi died, her parents did not know she had turned back to sex work and thought she had found employment in another place, somewhere in a safer environment. As a sex worker, Samardi sent her parents almost four times as much as they had earned in their rice farms. Sisang Mujasi was 26 years old and was from Indonesia. She came to Hong Kong in 2006. Initially, she moved to the city to work as a domestic worker, but was terminated. After finding out that she could earn more doing sex work while unemployed, Sisang began to do it full time. With the money Sisang sent home, her family was able to build a house on their property. On the day following Rurik's arrest, he confessed to the double murders of Samarti and Sisang. He said that he felt sorry because people he killed were good people. However, at the same time, he did not feel guilty for killing them in such a heinous matter. Before Rurik's trial began, the judge presiding over the case warned the jury that some of the evidence presented at this trial was very graphic and brutal. He recommended jurors have a strong stomach if they were going to attend the trial. Rurik filmed the murders on his phone as well as the torture. In parts of the video, he describes the murders of Samarti and Sisang in heinous detail. A rope, a blowtorch, and a serrated knife were among the pieces of evidence presented by the prosecution at Rurik's trial. 
Rurik pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter and unlawful burial of a body. He claimed that he had diminished capacity at the times he committed the crimes, due to the fact that Samardi and Sisang had initially moved to Hong Kong as domestic workers. A group representing migrant workers attended the trial. As a way of expressing their support, they held candlelight vigils for the victims and called for justice and a speedy trial for them. In his defense, Rurik blamed sadism and narcissism. Also, he claimed that he suffered sexual abuse at the hands of another boy when he was a child. Due to the alleged abuse, he became impaired and unable to control his behavior. Due to the overwhelming evidence against Rurik, including hours of video and thousands of photos, the jury found him guilty. After just eight minutes of deliberation, Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal denied Rurik's appeal in August of this year. He is serving his life sentence in maximum security Stanley Prison. What do you think about the tragic slang of Sasang and Samardi? Is Rurik truly mentally ill or just a spoiled, privileged man? What case would you like to see covered next? And don't forget to hit the bell icon and subscribe.